This is Aminata Desert Rose Plant Walker Firewoman, and I'm here with my special guest today, Anna Gottman. So Anna, we start every show by looking at what is good. So tell me for you today, what is good? Mm, what is good? What is you good, are good. Anna? You are good. I am good. We are each a force for good. Yes. And we are in this place where we get to choose. Mm -hmm. There's a saying, some rabbi in uh, Judaism, that we each hold the balance of the world in our hands. Mm -hmm. And with every act, we can choose good or evil. Mm -hmm. So we are good. Mm -hmm. With every and act. The, yeah. We can choose good or evil. Hmm. So what makes you choose good, Anna? You know, it is it, an interesting question because I think the essence of our soul for each one of us is good. Mm. Our highest self, our divine self, our inner being, whatever you call that, mm -hmm. is good. And when we act in alignment with our higher self, our inner being, what we do is good in the world and we 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 bless the world and we create wholeness in the world it is when we are not in alignment and integrity with our higher self that we don't do good mm -hmm. and so if i'm triggered if i'm triggered by something someone says something i might see something in the news or it might be something that a friend says and suddenly i'm triggered and so then i'm in trauma or i'm in a wound I'm in a reactive mode. That's when I risk not doing good and being good. And we all have that. Well, let's 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 bring it maybe a little more personal. Because at this point, you know, you're in a in a you know, you're in a certain decade of your life. I would call you a queen, you know. <laughs> you're in and 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 so you didn't start off where you are now. Certainly you've been on some kind of journey to get here, right? Yeah. 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 And so I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got to this very settled space. And I also grew up, if I ever write my memoir, mm -hmm. my biography, my first sentence is going to be, I grew up into, I, I, I was born into a life of extremes. Mm. And so while I had this essence of joy, I grew up with a stutter, a severe stutter undiagnosed learning challenges, an alcoholic mom, a raging dad. You know, there was always, there was also a lot of love. It's not just that, but those were the traumas. Yeah. And, and the undiagnosed learning challenges in school became a very significant trauma for me. Mm. And so this is, and red hair and freckles, which were not popular and add to that the stutter. And I grew up, I, I, I was born and raised in Israel. And my mm. mother wasn't Jewish. So that was a secret that I kept, I kept until I left Israel. So I lived with a secret. Mm. Um, so all of these things were part of my childhood. And then I ended up, my parents divorced. And my mom went back to Sweden for a treatment for her alcoholism because she was Swedish. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, you know, low self-esteem, self-loathing. I uh, thought I was stupid because I didn't, I did finish high school, but I, you know, thought of myself as stupid. I swore I'd never go back to school. Here I am with a doctorate, but I swore I'd I was never just go back gonna to school. Say. I swore I'd never go back. I was due into the military service, which is mandatory for women in Israel. And my dad had been a pilot and um, I grew up to, you know, with values of being a patriot and giving back to your country. The, your country gives to you. You have to give back to your country. That's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. And there I was, finished high school. I had six months to go into the military service. And I visited my mom in Sweden. And I was sitting with a friend who was in line at the pharmacy in Sweden. I had this big blue sweater hiding behind a, a redhead bush and in and, and, and a big sweater. And this older woman was staring at me and made me uncomfortable and at some point she comes to me and she says would you like to work as a fashion model and travel the world wait 
So you're at a coffee shop and then someone steps up and asks you that question? I'm in a pharmacy. Oh, a sitting pharmacy? in line Not even while a my shop. friend, my friend, is, she, she has a number. She's standing in line to buy something and I'm just waiting for her on the bench. And this lady sitting to my left, staring at me and says, do you want to work as a fashion model and travel the world? And what was your answer? You know, it's interesting. I, as my dad was a pilot, then I had traveled the world. I mean, not all of it, but but I had traveled. So that didn't impress me. It wasn't like, okay, fashion models seemed so out of place with my internal experience of myself. And she gave me her card and she expected me to call her as soon as I came home because that's what the girls usually did. They'd call and I didn't call because I somehow thought she was going to call me. So after three days, she calls me and said, are you not interested? I said, I am. I just expected you to call. And in the meantime, my mom, I told her and she had heard about her. So she was a well-known scout for John Casablancas, who created Elite Model Management. He's passed away since, but Elite is obviously well-known. And so... um. You know, two months later, I I met John and he said, you have a specific look that will either work immediately or will never work. So come to Paris for two weeks. And I went to Paris for two weeks against the instructions of my dad, who was really scared for me that I'd be kidnapped and God knows what. And I never looked back. I moved to Paris. I, I was on the cover of 16 magazine after two and a half weeks. And I worked for Elle magazine after a month. And it, I just shot straight up. And it was like, how did Cinderella become a fashion model in Paris? So there I was doing that while my internal experience was still one of, of you know, everything I shared before. Mm. But it allowed me to have a new environment and to start valuing myself that I actually had value a new context yeah so tell me about the military service weren't you still required or did you get exempted I was no I I ended up so for men are required no matter what but women get exempted if they get married and so I, I I I can admit now it was more of a secret before I I got married to a friend in Sweden and we were married for a while um and I got released from the military service, which today with my value system, I'm really glad that I ended, I didn't go. Mm. Um, but, uh, but at the time it was no small decision. I know that anyone listening is going, oh, well, of course I'd pick Paris over Israel. But when you're your community, your people, your tribe, I mean, the Jewish people is this tribe and we hold together mm. and the world is against us. I mean, I grew up on all of this. Right. And again, my dad was a pilot. And so it was like, it was a big thing. I thought my whole, my, my friends would never speak to me again. So it was really, do I go back to my life and to the Cinderella that I was in, in with my dad and his wife? It was pretty mean. And, um, or do I take a risk in a country? I don't know a language. I don't speak a profession that is hard. Um, but I get my freedom and I get, and, and it may seem obvious to anyone listening. It was not obvious. I tortured over it for two months. Yeah. I don't think it's obvious. I think when you grow up, uh, you've been conditioned into a certain, as you said, to be a patriot and, yeah. you know, it's the Jewish people and the rest of the world. So it's like choosing, are you choosing yourself? Or are you choosing your community? I could see that yeah. that being a really hard choice. So yeah. you you made the choice to go with the with the supermodel yes. career. So, it's just odd that the choice for you <laughs> was the military or being a supermodel. Most people right. don't it get was those like, two options. I know, which is why it's a life of extreme. And I think that life has given me that because we all get these choices. People can can listen now and say, well, lucky you. I never got choices like that. But the truth is we each, and I've seen it, I'm 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 old enough to see that everybody gets opportunities and everybody gets choices. And we're scared to take those choices because we have to lose the ground that we stand on many times. And, and it, it, there's a beautiful um, saying by Andre Gide, in order to discover new land, we have to lose sight of the shore for a very long time. 
if you just dabble from island to island, you're you're just in the same region. But if you lose sight of the shore that is familiar to you for a long time, then you discover a new land. Mm -hmm. And we all get these opportunities. All of us. They can be small. They can be big. We all get them. And I write in my latest book, Sh Sh Shift Calling, that all you need is a one degree shift and compounding over time, that one degree shift, one shift in your behavior is going to change and transform your life. Okay. I do want to go into your book, Anna. Yeah. Um, but I want to just challenge yeah. you because I'm hearing two things at the same time. Yes. So you said um, if you stay within the site of land, you're really, yeah. you're just going to go island, island. You're not really making yeah. a profound difference. But now right. you just said you can just make one degree Yes. So tell us what's the. So I'll tell you. So there's this, it's an aviation. It's the one to 60. It, it, it's like a rule. If, if a pilot um, shifts the plane, the trajectory of, of, of a plane by one degree, it's very small. And if they would land immediately, that wouldn't be noticed. But if that one degree, if they continue for 10 minutes, they'll be 60 miles off course. And if they continue for a few hours, they'll end up in New York instead of in Chicago. So the same, so, if, so let's take the metaphor of the ocean. Here I am in my ship. I'm only making a one degree shift, okay? I'm not going from island to island. I'm making a one degree shift. But if I keep going away from my, the familiar shore, one degree shift, I'm going to end up in a different direction over time than if I stayed on the same course. So when I decided to be what they call in Paris a top model, I like that didn't just fall into I mean, the, the opportunity came to me, but it was daily decisions. As I said, I struggled for two months. Should I do it? Should I not? Am I betraying my friends? Will they never speak to me? Will my dad, should I go against my dad's will? It's like, am I betraying my mother? My parents were going through a bloody divorce. So am, am I taking sides? I mean, all of that were the small little shifts that I had to choose. And each one helped me to, to end up in Paris. But so it wasn't just a, a one thing. When you hear the story, it's like she was here and then she's there, right? But it's these small shifts every day. If I tell myself, it's like, let's just start here. If I just say, I am lovable. Mm -hmm. I am lovable. I am precious. I don't walk. I, I mean, I don't walk around saying that. Mm -hmm. But if I started now and every day I would say that, there would be shifts that would happen because the world would reorganize itself around that in a different way. And in a year, let's say, or in three months or in two weeks, I'll be in a different shore. I see seeing a different saying. piece of land. Yes. You know, my daughter said this when I interviewed her on the show, we were talking about the winter solstice. And she said, one person can change trajectory. It's not the same thing as changing something that happened in the past, but you can change your, your trajectory. Yeah. And, um, and if you stay in the, the space of that little decision. Yes. That then little I see how it accumulates. It accumulates and suddenly, so all you have to do is say, I am precious. I'm precious. I'm worthy of my dreams. I'm worthy of what I long for. And if you keep saying that, you, you're going to start believing it. You're going to start believing it. You're going to start taking actions and opportunities are going to show up in your field of awareness that weren't there when you weren't saying it, when I'm not saying it. So that's the one degree shift that over time ends you up on a different piece of land in New York instead of Chicago. So it's not this hard work. I need to transform. I need to do this huge thing. You need a small shift that you're willing to stay with that is suddenly you're going to say, oh, oh my God, I'm, I'm seeing a different land. There's yeah. a different earth that I'm walking on because I made a small shift. So tell me about more about the field of awareness, because I think sometimes we can't even see choices depending on our awareness choice doesn't even occur right so tell me about that you know i i think that we need to do you know ask and you shall receive right 
the words of Jesus, I believe, right? Ask and you shall receive. I think that we need to ask. And I think that every, everybody asks. Everybody's longing for something. We might not see the opportunities, but if we ask for it, and we ask mm -hmm. for it, and we ask for it, if we ask, so 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 here it is. You need to ask, then mm -hmm. you need to listen. If you just ask and you never listen, mm -hmm. then you just keep repeating the belief that you don't get your your wishes met. You have mm -hmm. to ask and you have to listen. It's interesting because the four keys to uh, spiritual material wholeness, which are the content of my first book, are exactly that. First, you ask. The second, you need to listen. And in the listening, you'll receive an answer. And in the answer, it can come through a message, through a friend or a movie you see in a sentence or a song with a phrase or an inner knowing, a gut feeling. Many times what happens at that moment, we don't take the action because the third key of the, the four keys to spiritual material wholeness is inspired action. So once you listen and you hear, that's where people stop. They go, oh, that can't be the answer. Is that the answer? Was it my thinking? Was it my mind? Or was it really? And we use that because we're scared, which I understand. You know, I've done scary things in my life. Um, <clears throat> but it's the inspired action. If we stay connected to the asking and the longing and then the listening and what came, Slowly, slowly, the sound of the universe or the sound of God or spirit or the goddess or earth is going to get louder and louder and louder. <clears throat> but we need to show up for our own life. Yes. I want to say out loud, something happened to me yesterday. I woke up and I prayed to my mother. So when, mm. I'm, when I'm like really down, I pray to my mother. My mother passed away. And mm. I was like, and I was praying for clarity and confidence you know, what do I do? I need help. This is mm -hmm. to my mother. And um, I had a coaching call, you know, with a business coach. And we went into a very disruptive place for me where I couldn't see the shore. <laughs> and it occurred to me in the middle of the call, oh, wait, Amanda, you prayed for this. Mm -hmm. You asked for this. And this is what came today. Is mm -hmm. this, you know, this disruptive thing that this person is telling you. Yeah. So, um, so I just want to co-sign right. on it. Right. Asking, and then and when like you're you disruptive, said, listening, yes. like you said, yes. expecting yeah. the, looking for the answer, listening. Yeah. So, so the four keys to spiritual material wholeness are expansive presence. That's the asking and being in this expansive space and spaciousness where you can then listens and attentive listen attentive listening is the second key and inspired action is the third key and then faithful knowing is how you walk in the world right and in this moment of disruption if we go back to your example so you have this moment of disruption that you realize that you asked for but i can imagine tell me at that moment of disruption you go more into your suddenly you're disconnected because you go to those places where maybe there's a trigger. There's the lonely you, the child you, wh whatever messages, right? Yep. Yeah. So so it's harder from that place. Yes. To go, oh, I'll just keep going. But okay, we need to go back to the wound mm. and go, okay, here it is again. What can I take from it again? Mm-hmm. How can I be tender with a wound mm -hmm. and take something from there again in order to, you know, put it in my bag and mm -hmm. walk as a pilgrim on, on the earth mm. on my next step as you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like there's the disruption. Then there's, I mean, think of the chrysalis. The chrysalis is a disruption. It's Extreme. a complete meltdown. It's a complete meltdown. No caterpillar sprouts wings mm -hmm. it is a complete meltdown and there needs to be a trust and then the magnificent butterfly comes out right mm. so mm. there's a place of embracing and we all have i mean me we, we all have that when we go to the meltdown it feels like we're losing we're losing our mind mm -hmm. 
there's the despair. We're, and, and, and we are because something is melting, mm. something that some darkness within our being where there was no light can be a hurt, a wound, the energy is stifled. Something there is opening up and saying, okay, pay attention to me. That's what I call the shift calling you. What shift is calling you? It's that thing that's not going away right now and is telling you, listen to me. And it's not your enemy as we always feel it is. Our challenges are our enemies. It's our biggest ally because that part is wanting to come out of the darkness and to be seen and to offer its gifts Mm -hmm. and its treasures. And so we just need to learn to master ourselves. I don't know master if that's a good word, but here it came out. Um, When we are in the midst of, of the pain or the despair or just triggered in like a second to say, oh, that's the old trigger. How can I override it? Can I share a story from from the Israeli-Palestinian war right now, which is exactly yes. about that? Yes. So <clears throat> um, in the days after the October 7 um, event, mm-hmm. when Hamas attacked all the um, villages um, outside of Gaza, Gaza um, there was a... a, a, a um, police or like a squad, a, a, a military team that mm-hmm. came with with a dog. Mm-hmm. And they went through from burnt house to burnt house to see if there's any survivors. And so they go from house to house and they went into a house that was burnt down and they saw nothing there and they were leaving. And the dog that was with them was trained to smell Um went to its trainer and asked for a treat and put the treat in its mouth, but did not eat it and went back to the burnt house and came, came back a few minutes later and asked its trainer for a second treat, put it in its mouth, didn't eat it and went back to the house that was burnt down. And after a few minutes came out with a wounded dog, that was scared Mm -hmm. and the dog came out with that dog. Mm -hmm. Now I'm telling that story because think what it takes for a dog to override a reactive response to treat. Oh, it's for me. And the intelligence to know that a treat gets a dog to do something. So I'll get another dog to do something with a treat. Mm -hmm. And then the compassion the, the, the dog has, I mean, the evolved consciousness mm-hmm. of this dog to do that without instructions or training ever to actually do that. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the connection here is at the moment of trauma is when we need to also have our observing self or our higher self come in because otherwise we just collapse right, right. to the old st- story and I do it, we all do it. Mm-hmm. But we need to develop the evolution of consciousness on our planet is, okay, there's the trauma. We need to acknowledge it. We need to grieve it. It's always going to be there to an extent. Mm. But can we also have another part that's going to bring the treat Mm -hmm. to the wounded self Mm -hmm. and lure it out? Yes, I see. To invite to come the out of the hiding or the darkness or the trigger that we have at this moment to invite mm-hmm. it out into the light. Cause once it's in the light, mm-hmm. it, it, it has the place to share its story. Mm-hmm. The grief, the incident has the time it, it can share its story. It has its wounding. It has its message. It has its protective mm-hmm. um, purpose. Mm-hmm. It has gems. And then we move on to, to our next phase. So, so mm-hmm. now we have that as a resource. So I think that that's really important to develop you know, that extra that capacity um, capacity. I, I I'm I'm with you on that, and um, and it is a capacity that can be developed with use, right? Yeah, with repetition, and when you know you're in your wound, you can also ask for someone to help you 
kind of elevate so that you yeah. can hold it rather than just be submerged by it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really beautiful. 